Uh, our next speaker is Professor Brett Week from the uh, Washington University in St. Louis, who will speak on the ideal membership in the algebra of bounded analytic functions, topless current approach. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for that introduction. Um, so let me first begin by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to give a talk in this workshop. Uh, this is one of my favorite problems. Um, it's nice to be able to speak about things, the, the corona problem in general. It's nice to be able to speak about things connected to this. Um, it used to be very easy to find results on the corona problem on Google. You just would Google corona problem and you could find good mathematics, except corona problem now, of course, means something else uh, in the world. And so it's a little harder to find the mathematics at times. So uh, I'm going to tell you about a slight variant of the corona problem where uh, we call it the ideal problem. And I'll tell you what's known, and then I'll give you some ideas of the proof that goes into this. So uh, let's just start with the story. So I guess um, everyone is probably very familiar with H infinity, so the um, algebra of bounded analytic functions on the disk. And the question that we want to be concerned about, oops, sorry, it's not what I meant to do. Um, the question we want to be concerned about is we're gonna be given <clears throat> data F and F1 through Fn. And we would like to understand when F belongs to the ideal generated by the F1 through the Fn's. And so this is the collection of the sums of gj's, fj's. Um, and we would like some conditions on uh, on f and f1 through fn so that um, f is written as the sum of the fj's times the gj's. Okay, so this uh, is a slight variant of the corona problem because if you take f to be one, uh, the constant function one, then um, this is asking if one can be written as a sum of the f times g's, which uh, is the corona problem of Carlison. And I guess um, once you see it's connected to the, car the corona problem of Carlison, you can see that there's a necessary condition. Uh, if I take this equation and I apply um, uh, the absolute value to both sides and make obvious estimates, then you get in a condition like this. So some constant times the sum of the fj of z. Um, and we know that this condition is sufficient in Carlison's case when f is identically one, and that's the, the deep theorem of, of Carlison. So in this general setup, uh, unfortunately, um, this necessary condition isn't sufficient in general. And you can see this as an example due to Rao, and you can find this in Garnett's book. Um, okay, so on this is the general question we're gonna be after. We'll be after trying to understand this sort of question, and we would like um, conditions of this flavor where we have uh, some sort of size condition on F and some sort of size condition on the FJ. Now, um, this leads to the following problem that we'll, 
be interested in. So we're going to change the uh, conditions slightly. So we're going to take uh, function phi, which maps the uh, real, the non-negative real numbers to the non-negative real numbers. And we're going to assume a size condition of the form uh, phi is, uh, f is less than or equal to phi applied to the, the, the vector norm of the f's. And we want to understand what sort of conditions on phi or f will allow uh, f to belong to the ideal generated by the f1 through fn. So um, the functions to keep in mind here are the following. So you should keep in mind something like phi of s equals s to the p. And then there are some categories here. So if p is bigger than 2, um, you can uh, this condition becomes sufficient. And again, you can the, the p equals 3 case was Wolf's theorem, and you can find it in Garnett. Um, so this is OK. Uh, if you look at p less than 2, um, this is not sufficient. Again, this is some modification of the, uh, the Rao result. Um, and then you have the case P equals two, which was kind of a critical case. And this is um, uh, not sufficient by a, a very nice observation of trail. And so then, oh, how do I get rid of this thing? So that suggests we should be considering functions of the form uh, phi of s <clears throat> that um, grow slightly more slowly. Then t goes to t squared, I say. OK, so the spoiler alert, Trail gave a good answer to this question. Um, and here's the theorem that he came up with. So he says that if you take a function psi, that's a non-increasing, non-negative function on the non-negative reals. And if you assume that psi has an integrability condition um, at infinity, basically, uh, and then if you let phi of s be s squared psi of log uh, 1 over s squared. And if you take uh, little f and then f1 through fn, which belong to h infinity, and you assume this corresponding uh, kind of uh, control on, on the information, then it's possible to find g1 through gn. Um, so that f can be written as the sum of f1 times g1 plus f2 times g2 plus dot, 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 fn times gn. So the functions that this allows for is something like phi of s to be uh, s squared divided by log 1 over s squared to the 1 plus epsilon. OK, so let me just say a couple of words, uh, uh, some prior work, and let me say a couple of words about Trails Proof. Um, so Trails Proof uses the following ideas. So it uses uh, Nikolsky's lemma. Nikolsky's lemma gives um, a necessary and sufficient condition for a left inverse to a given object to exist in terms of the existence of a bounded analytic projection valued function. Now, left inverse, if you phrase it correctly, can be seen as finding the G that you care about to solve Carlison's problem. Um, Nikolsky's lemma can be modified to give necessary and sufficient conditions to solve the ideal question. So that tells you that you just need to find this bounded analytic projection valued function. And then the way you uh, can go about doing that is you can, 
take an obvious solution, which for those who prove Corona theorems or read the Corona proofs, you know that there exists kind of a, a strategy of you take a canonical, obvious, non-analytic solution, and then you perturb that in some way so that it, it becomes analytic and you don't destroy the corresponding bounds. And that's what Trail does. And the, the way he accomplishes that is a use of Nahari's theorem. Now, this, um, there's been other work done by many people here, and I just want to point to some of it. Um, they all involved variants of imposing conditions on phi. Some might have been very explicit functions where you had the S squared and then maybe some slightly different decay factor. But there, there exists prior work, and let me point to it. So you can see the work by, oops, um, Sagro. Uh, Lynn, uh, Jordy Powell, and Tavon Trent. Okay, so they all have some variant of, of these kind of estimates. Again, since this is an old question, it's not surprising that there's been some, some nice work done in this direction. So um, I want to tell you that the theorem Michael Hartz and I were able to prove. And so let me give you the statement of the theorem here, and I'll explain it a little bit. So I mentioned in the, it was mentioned at the very beginning of the slide, but so this is joint with Michael Hartz. Um, uh, Michael was a postdoc at Wash U uh, a couple of years ago now. And this is one of the projects he worked on when he was there. So this is a slight improvement over Trail's result in that we have a slightly different condition here. Um, I don't want to focus so much on that improvement. What I would like to talk more about is the differences in the method of proof. So I've told you Trail's proof kind of focuses on the uh, H infinity side directly and uses Nikolsky's lemma and Nahari's theorem. Instead, I'm going to give you the ideas of a proof that use operator theory. And uh, there are similarities, of course, between the two things, but um, it is what it is. So here's the idea. Um, F's the f is going to be a row vector. And the h is going to be a column vector. So the h's. And so then when I look at the uh, product between f and h, that will just give me a scalar. And so I'm just solving the corresponding um, ideal question for scalars. Uh, and so this is saying that if we have um, the same kind of condition of, of integrability of this function psi. And if phi is s squared times psi of log one over s squared, then uh, it's possible to find uh, an h such that the f's times the h's are the little f with some norm control here. And this constant c depends upon the data uh, f and the function phi. And I'll explain that a little bit as we go along. So the goal of the rest of this talk is to give you some of the ideas that go into the proof of this theorem and sketch some of the details of the proof. So um, this is a statement about H infinity. And what I would like to do is turn this into a statement about uh, L2 kind of functions or H2 functions to be more precise. And so let me state um, a lemma here and the corresponding way we prove it. So uh, again, many of you are probably familiar with this lemma in the case of H infinity for Carlison's theorem, where this lemma says, um, again, if you were to take, uh, let me kind of imagine this were the function one and this were the function one, um, then it's saying that you could solve corona uh, if and only if you can solve the, it's sometimes called the Toplitz corona problem. It's sometimes called the baby corona problem. So here it's saying that you can solve an H2 version of the question instead of solving the H infinity version of the question. And the hope is that by translating to uh, the H2 version of the question, it becomes easier because you have some Hilbert space techniques that you're able to exploit. So um, people may know this as the Toplitz Corona theorem.
And now this exploits the fact that H2 has a complete nivellina pit kernel. And so that's fundamental for the, the arguments that are given. Um, here, so this one you should think of as uh, the ideal question. Or if you take little f to be one, you can think of this as the corona question. And this you should think of as the H2 corona problem. So the H2 ideal slash corona. Okay, so um, these will be equivalent. Now, let me give you the idea. Um, this is the uh, a theorem of Leach, which is some extension of Douglas's lemma from operator theory. And it says that you can find this inverse, kind of the left inverse, if and only if you have this operator norm inequality. And so we'll take this as uh, a statement. And let me give you an idea of how you prove the equivalence between um, two and three in the event. I know there are many experts in the audience who've probably seen all of this, but I'm also guessing that just by looking at the list of participants, there are some students who haven't necessarily seen all this. And so let me just give some idea of what goes into this. So <clears throat> um, let's see if we can keep it on the screen. So one uh, implies two. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to let big G equals uh, equals H times little g. And now little g is a function in, sorry, I'm just trying to look at the notes here, really far away. Uh, H is a corresponding <coughs> um, H infinity function and little g is a, a vector. So this will belong to, sorry, big H is a, a vector, little g is a H infinity h infinity vector. So this will belong to h2 of n. And so then you can check that f g equals f h g, which is f times g. And so here you just do the obvious multiplication where you have lumped them together. And then of course, norm control is immediate because the h2 norm of this thing uh, will be less than or equal to the corresponding h infinity norm times the corresponding um, H2 norm of G. Um, and then two implies one, uh, you're gonna consider some multiplication operators, MF as a map from H2 of N to H2, and M little f as a map from H2 to H2. And then you have to show that um, M F M F star is bigger than or equal to say one over a constant squared M little f M little f star. Um, and this you can just check uh, kind of by hand, and I guess that follows from the hypothesis in two. And then apply uh, Leach's theorem. Okay. All right. So great. Let's restate uh, what we're after now then. So by using that lemma, our new goal becomes the following proposition, which is a H2 version of what we're after. So again, we have the hypothesis on phi, we have the hypothesis on psi, we take a, uh, a row vector of 
h infinity functions. We take a single h infinity function, little f, and we assume the size conditions. I guess I should say that the norm of the row vector becomes the obvious thing that appeared in the statement of the problem at the very beginning. And now we're going to be after um, uh, if you give me a little g, I have to find a big G, which is a, a, a vector of um, H2 functions, so that this equation, big F times big G equals little f times little g. And we have some corresponding norm control. OK, so let me make some comments here about some standard semi-standard reductions you can, you can do. Um, so you can assume. Um, that big F, so the vector, has no zeros. Uh, this is a application of inner outer factorization. And this is a, a fairly standard thing that happens in these sort of arguments. So I won't say much more about that. And then you can assume that big F, little f, and g um, are analytic in a neighborhood of the disk and um, in the closure of the disk. And this follows from a, a, a compactness argument, which is again, fairly standard. And so I won't say much more about that. So now let me talk a little bit about uh, the ideas that go into the proof. So one of the things that happens in these corona theorems is you always have a canonical obvious solution. And so what we'll do is we'll start with the obvious canonical solution. Um, this is a vector such that when I take the appropriate inner product with the vector f, it will produce uh, like one in the, in the corona theorem or it'll produce the f or the g we're after. So you're dividing by the norm of something, so you need some some reasonable hypotheses for this to make sense. Um, now, this is the ideas that go into solving the. This is using some of the ideas from Nikolsky's lemma and work pre previous work by Trail and Trail and myself, where we studied the Corona theorem using these bounded analytic projections. And what we're going to do is define a projection function pi uh, in the following way. So you have the identity minus, and then this sort of expression. And it's a very straightforward computation to show that pi squared equals pi. And uh, pi of z um, is the orthogonal projection. Onto uh, the kernel of f of z. Um, I will caution you here in the event that you try to read Michael's and my paper and you try to read Sergey's paper that uh, there's a difference in the projections that are used. It's an issue of a left inverse versus a right inverse. And so it's an issue of a transpose, but it's a rather standard translation and everyone can more or less easily figure out how to make that translation. But for us, this will be the projections we care about. So I want you to think of phi as the obvious canonical solution and pi as this thing that's just going to be playing an interesting role. So then you can do some <coughs> um, uh, computations. You can just go through and compute the corresponding uh, formulas that exist in here. And this is a, a standard um, exercise using derivatives and derivatives with the inverse and adjoints and so on. It's not. Um, it's not difficult, it's just a rather direct, straightforward computation. Uh, for example, you can show that d pi will have, uh, after you do the algebra, something like identity minus pi times some stuff, which is obvious things that come about. And so that's why you get equations like pi d pi equals zero. Okay, so this is a computational lemma that we'll utilize later in the course of the argument. Now, I want to tell you one of the main tools that goes into this so that it will have the corresponding Green's formula. So let me just tell you a couple things here. So uh, just for normalization purposes, this La uh, Laplacian tilde is one quarter the normal Laplacian. 
which is just dv bar. And this measure d mu is uh, the canonical measure that comes about from applying Green's theorem. And it's just this quantity. Okay, so this says that we can understand uh, information about u on the boundary of the disk. So t is close to the boundary of the disk uh, in terms of its value at the center, and then an integral of something on, on the internal inside of the disk. Okay, so let me give you this proposition. So this is trying to reduce it to um, this these integral estimates. So I said we have to get, like if we wanna solve the problem, we need to, I mean, there has to be some analysis that goes into it. And this is the corresponding analysis. This is gonna be the thing we'll have to kind of fuss over in, in the rest of the talk, trying to understand how to get estimates of this form. And so let me kind of give you an idea of how one goes about doing this. Okay, so um, our goal, because we've changed it to an H2 goal, is find capital G, which belongs to H2N, with FG equals little fg. Okay, and so what you can check is I, I told you there's this canonical solution. So you look at F phi little F phi little f g, and this becomes uh, little f g. And that's because uh, you should think of phi as the obvious solution. Okay, and so what we'll do is um, we'll call this thing here G0. And so G0 solves the problem in the sense that it has good estimates, uh, but it's not holomorphic. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to, um, so we need to find a V which belongs to uh, L2, which belongs to, sorry, what's doing that? L2 of the circle intersect the kernel of F Uh, such that uh, G0 minus V belongs to H2 of N. And if we are able to do this, then we set G to be this new thing, G0 minus V, and we look at F G, this becomes F G0 minus F V, which becomes little F G. And so we'll have solved the problem. So our goal now is to understand how we can get this argument to come about. And so if I look at this equation now, um, this you can say is the same as the following sort of expression, an integral over the circle of G0H dm, equals an integral over the circle of V H dn for all H in H2 n perp. So our goal is to find this V and we have at our disposal to do so the left-hand side. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on the left-hand side and apply Green's theorem to the left-hand side. So this thing, uh, let me write it over here. Is the same as an integral over the disk, the Laplacian of phi f 
g h d mu. And then you can write this as an integral over the disk of d of, and then you can play around with the derivatives and use the fact that f and g are analytic and h is anti-analytic. And if you think about what happens in this pairing, when you pass the d over, there you pick up a bar in the appropriate spot to make things all work. So the point is that the derivative, so remember that this thing is just a d, d bar. Uh, the d bar only hits the function phi is the, is the point. Um, and then you, we use one of these computational lemmas that says, uh, pi d bar phi is d bar phi. So I have a hidden pi there that I can bring over to the other side. And so then this is equal to an integral over the disk of d of d bar phi f g. And then I have pi h. And this thing here, we will call c. And our goal <clears throat> is then to show that this new form can be dominated by some constant times the norm of C in L2, where C is pi h. And if we go back, uh, that's exactly this equation that I told you that we have to somehow worry about. So our goal now is really to understand um, how to prove this inequality. Because once we have this, then, then you can say, well, this is a bounded linear functional. And you can apply the Reese representation theorem to say that this thing. So apply, let me just finish the proof for you. So apply Reese representation theorem. to get that uh, the integral over t of g zero h dm, which was the same as integral over d of d d bar phi fg pi h d mu. And this is the same as integral over t of v uh, pi c. Sorry, uh, well, we can write that way. Pi. Can we call it? We actually write it as pi h, and then you can bring the the pi to the other side, and that will be what we wanted. And so this becomes an integral over pi v comma h dn, and this says now that v belongs to um, the kernel of F, which is what we needed. Okay, so, and then you can play with the estimates in the obvious way because you have, uh, you have that this function here has, um, is what you're after. And so the corresponding estimates on G will be less than the norm of the G zero in H2 plus the norm of the V in H2. And then as long as you have good control everywhere, you're, you're totally fine. So that's the idea. So the rest of the time we need to come back and try to make sense of uh, this estimate here and how we prove this estimate. Now, as many people probably know, um, one of the main ingredients that goes into this is Carlison measures. And so we'll have to take a slight detour to talk a little bit about Carlison measures. So many of these Carlison measure estimates we need were already, um, they're kind of off the shelf. We could take them directly from uh, Sergey's paper, however, not all. And so we needed to construct some. And so let me just tell you some of these estimates and I'll try to phrase it in a way that makes it more clear. And then I'll give you some ideas of how many of these are proved or what the main ingredient that goes into it. So um, assuming all the hypotheses on the F, the G, the Pi, the Psi and so on, then uh, what this says is that if you integrate a function G against uh, the following measure that has been highlighted, you can control um, 
the integral over the disk by some very precise constant times the uh, the h2 norm of the corresponding function. And so it says that this object here, is uh, an H2 Carlison measure. And again, since it's probably well known, but in the event it's not, the Carlison measure condition is exactly the statement that if you um, integrate G squared against, let's call it D nu, this is no worse than some constant times the norm of G in H2 squared for all G in H2. This is the definition. of Carlson measure. Okay, so these are all theorems that Trail took care of for us. So we have all these kind of black boxes um, that say various things are Carlson measures. So again, in this particular situation, if I highlight the function here, the player role, that's some sort of Carlson measure. It's a slightly different, it's a Carlson measure for a different object. It's, it's for this uh, function C, but that's okay. Think of this as a Carlson measure. And think of um, D as saying something about an equivalent norm for Cs in H2. Okay. Um, so we did need to prove some. And so there are some computational lemmas that come about. So uh, let me just say that you define some functions in the following way. Uh, you define alpha and beta to be these very explicit functions. And then um, you can compute in a very precise manner that this right-hand side uh, behaves this way. And part of the what we really needed was the left-hand side, because that's something that will appear in the course of the proof. So at the moment, let's just accept that as a case. And so then notice that this left-hand side is the object that feeds in over here. And so this new lemma was one that Michael and I had to come up with in the course of the proof. And the point is it gives you some precise constant. But again, there's something that's a Carlison measure, just keep that in mind. So let me give you a couple comments about the proof. We won't really go into a lot of these proofs. So um, they all use some variant of Uchiyama's lemma. And so what it says is if you have a function uh, phi, which is bounded subharmonic, uh, and let's suppose one is less than zero, uh, phi is less than or equal to zero, then um, you can prove things like Laplacian of phi times uh, log one over mod z d mu is Carlison. And you have a very precise constant that comes about. And the proof is application of Green's theorem, which I, I told you earlier, to a function u, which looks like e to the phi mod f squared, and then computations. OK, that's the idea. All these other lemmas are some variant of Uchiyama's lemma in different forms. So what I want you to take away from these last couple of minutes is we have a bunch of Carlson estimates that are at our disposal and I will apply them as we need them going forward. So what we now need to do is try to make sense about this last integral. Um, Okay, so our goal is to estimate this left-hand side. Uh, let me see, I think I wrote that down. Yeah. So our goal here is at the bottom. Our goal is this particular estimate. So it means I need to understand this expression here and I need to have good control on it. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a, um, put half of the F with each term, okay? So I'll bring one half to the other side and I'll keep one half on the other, on, on the, the, the left side. And the function G is just some scalar function that can um, come outside the pairing. 
Now, uh, I don't want to get into technicalities here. You have to be a little careful on what you can do with f because f is a holomorphic function and taking a root could cause you some headaches. It's not really a problem. Let's just, for the rest of the talk, pretend that um, everything's kosher and we can take square roots as we want. Uh, this is well explained within Trail's paper about how you can do this as some function on a Riemann surface and there's no problems with it then. But for us, let's just pretend everything's single valued. There's really no problems. So then what you're gonna do is take derivatives of the corresponding objects. And so um, that's all I've done here is I've write, written down the three corresponding derivative terms. And so you can just kind of think about it. There's a product rule that goes on here. And so the derivative has to hit each term in the corresponding product. So for example, there'll be one term where the derivative hits the G and the first two things are left over. And then you, you pull things around and you get something which looks like this. And then this takes advantage of no, that, that's all that is all that is. Uh, the other ones you'll have one where you have the derivative that hits this term, and that will be something like this. And then you'll have one where the derivative hits the first term, and that will be this expression. Okay, so we have these three terms. We need to control these three terms. I want to give you the ideas that go into controlling those three terms. And the goal is to get an estimate which looks like this at the end. So estimating integral one. So now. <clears throat> What we have here is that integrand, so maybe I can copy it. Uh, so we want to understand uh, the integral over the disk of d of d bar phi, f one half, f one half bar c. Sorry, this should be this, uh, and then a G, and then a D mu. And so what we need to do, this should be a square bracket here. What we need to do is compute this integrand a little more closely. And so you can show that this integrand, this term here becomes D, D bar phi comma Xi F plus one half d bar phi c f prime. Okay, so let's just think about this for a second. Um, again, you have the derivative here that's hitting a product of two terms, and so let's pretend there's there's not you know vectors or anything, and it's just a, a a scalar problem. And so if the derivative hits the first term, you would get something which looks like this. Um, and then you would have an f to the one half and an f to the one half bar, but that's in the pairing. So there's a conjugate on it. So it comes out and just becomes f. So that's how this one comes about. And then you have the one where the derivative would hit this expression. And so then you would get the one half that comes out. You get f to the minus one half and then f prime. But the f to the minus one half will hit this thing and become zero. And you'd just be left with the f prime. And so these are the two terms that show up in this expression. And so then we use these identities that I talked about. And so we're going to focus on this term for a second, these computational identities. And so you get d, d bar phi uh, xi becomes the same as phi f prime phi d pi xi, which becomes, OK, so this is just uh, technical estimates, but that's OK or technical computations, but I'm just sketching it for you. So you get something like this. And so if you collect all the terms together, so if you collect that term I've just done with this corresponding term and doing the same thing, uh, you can show that the integrand we have to worry about is something like
Okay. Okay, so then what we're going to do is apply Cauchy Schwartz to this expression. So we have this, this term, and so the integral one by Cauchy Schwartz will be no, no worse than the integral over the disk. And then we'll have a bunch of stuff that comes in here. So f to the minus three, uh, f to the three halves, uh, f f to the minus one half prime f star uh, norm d pi norm c mod g d mu and then you apply cauchy schwartz and you get some term which looks like the following you get f times d pi squared uh, c squared d mu and you get something like f squared norm f to the minus sixth, f f to the minus one half prime squared, I'm oh, sorry, f star squared g squared d mu. Okay, so let me just kind of give the idea again. I, I fussed over it before. I told you that things like this generate a Carlison measure. So this term should be controllable by G. And I told you that expressions like this are controllable by some sort of variant of a Carlison measure applied to the function C. And so this should be controllable. And so if you apply those Carlison measure estimates, you get something like E root for E plus two uh, norm C two. Okay. Um, let me, I was going to go through it if there was time, but let me say that two and three are, are done similarly. Um, you just have variants of the Carlson measure estimates. Uh, well, we won't go through that. So let me skip the skip this. And in my last little bit, I want to tell you uh, a conjecture of trails and a couple open problems. Since I think that's one of the benefits of these workshops is to point to things that people can try to do more generally. Um, so here's a conjecture from trails paper. Uh, so if phi of s is s squared psi of log one over s squared, where phi or psi, sorry, um, is bounded non increasing function. on R plus uh, such that the integral, so remember the condition was that the integral of psi had to be finite, psi, and we're gonna assume this is infinite now. Then if um, F is less than or equal to phi of the norm of F, Uh, this does not imply um, HF equals little f has a solution. So uh, this conjecture is trying to understand if this cutoff is really at, at um, the integrability of, of psi. Uh, let me give another question that um, also appears in in Trail's paper. There's some evidence that this could be true based on prior work of Sergey and myself in the case when uh, little f is one, but um, find necessary and sufficient conditions on um, in terms of Carlison measures. Uh, 
for f and little f uh, so a solution exists. Okay. Um, and so let me just say C uh, trail. And then the last question. So um, this one, I know of partial results in the area. I don't know of definitive results that kind of settle the story completely. Um, one of the things we used though was this connection between uh, H infinity and H2 and the nevelina pick kernel property that allowed this to go. Um, it's known that the multiplier algebras for certain other spaces of holomorphic functions, uh, this same phenomenon can happen because the corresponding Hilbert space has the complete nevelina pick property. And so it would be interesting to understand the full ideal questions that exist for other spaces of analytic functions. So let me just phrase this in a general term, ideal uh, properties of spaces of holomorphic functions. And the ones I have in mind are the so-called bessov sobolev spaces. Sobolev spaces. And so for example, uh, in this scale of spaces, if you take this parameter sigma to be zero, you get D, which is the Dirichlet space. And if you take this parameter to be one half, you get the Hardy space. And so the story I tried to tell you today is connected here. Um, the story here, you should see work by Trent and his uh, students, um, where he does things on the Dirichlet space. Uh, but let me also say that these bessoff sobolev spaces extend to the unit ball in a natural way. And this is a, a playground where you could form similar questions. So I think uh, I've gone a couple minutes over. I apologize for that, but I will stop here with my presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have time for questions. Hi, Brett. Uh, so uh, uh, is it correct that uh, the, the, the paper that uh, you just presented, it just gives another proof of a trail theorem? That's correct. Yeah. And uh, in in trail theorem, so uh, in some place he used uh, Nazarov's lemma. And uh, maybe, that's right. That, that's yeah, right. Maybe maybe uh, in in this Nazarov's lemma, one can just uh, uh, obtain a better better function psi there. So did you try it that way? No. No, I've not looked into that at all. I mean, oh. you, you, one could look to optimize that portion of the proof. I think that's how I'm interpreting your question. Is it possible to go back in in trails oh. proof and use Nazarov's lemma? So optimize Nazarov's Nazarov's lemma in some way. I have not explored that. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. <clears throat> Other questions? Yes, I have a question. Uh, I didn't. I didn't understand uh, why the function you obtained uh, with the with representation theorem uh, is in the kernel of f. Uh, it's because of the trick where you can pull the projection back over. So let's see if I can explain that again here slightly. Um, remember that this projection pi is a projection onto the kernel of f. And so you find V from the Reese representation theorem, and then you put pi on it because there's a hidden pi in the equation. And so then the new thing you really care about is pi times V, and that is in the kernel of F. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, if not, then let's thank our speaker again.